Morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, this is Surgy Vision's first face-to-face -face conference as a company. Um, as mentioned the other day, we're, we're a new company, but old faces and some familiar products. Um, formerly, um, I owned a company called Insight Surgical, which was sold to Paragon. Um, since then, a few years later, a few things changed and uh, products like MediContour IOLs, the first Q IOLs, and others came and we formed the company Surgy Vision. Um, we've been seeing a lot of support and thank you all for your support. And um, we've got a great panel here today to talk about the first Q add-on sulcus lens. Um, we've got Dr. Brian Harrisburg, Dr. Alison Chu, Dr. Cameron McLintock, and Andrew Appel. So um, I won't say too much more. Michael Kanicki was going to have a word, but he's lost his voice, so he's sitting down the back there just hiding. Um, if you'd like to come up, guys, and get started. Welcome. Uh, the purpose of this uh, symposium is to share clinical pearls and case studies that may influence all ophthalmologists who are interested in this lens. And there may be some uh, overlap between all of us. So what's the feature of the lens? It's a hydrophilic acrylic. It's a very large lens. So if you go diagonal, it's 13.5 in two, two directions. So it's bigger than most lenses. The notch is key because it's not equiconic. It's convex concave. There's no vaulting, uh, but it's uh, a very uh, well-structured lens that is stable in the sulcus. So what's this family? And this is the nice part about the platform. Depending on what case you got, you can add whatever component you need to make it work for your patient. So we got the SML lens, that was the first ones that I used. And we got Torex and we got multifocal platforms. And we'll look at all of these during the case studies. The key is rotational stability. You've got four point fixation and very, very little ciliary sulcus interaction. So I do believe it's very safe in the sulcus and unlikely to inflame or cause issues with uveitis. So we'll go straight into my first case. This is a lady who came from a colleague. She had surgery for a cataract in about 2003. And at that time, there were no significant toric lenses. And she batted along until uh, last year. And I think she had a cataract in the other eye. And then she realized uh, emetropia is quite achievable in one eye. And she felt uh, she wants to do something with her astigmatic eye that had surgery in 2003. So the surgeon put in a sulcaflex implant to correct the astigmatism, which worked beautifully. And then it started to go through its rotational instability. And um, the doctor took her back, rotated it back, and then lost control of this lens. So she called me and said, well, I'll leave it up to you. And the choices were take the lens out, maybe do uh, surface laser treatment uh, or attach the lens with uh, mechanical type sutures, which I've done many years ago for the sulcaflex toric, or to replace it. So we decided we will replace the lens. Her uncorrected vision at the time with the toric in the wrong position, of course, was 638. All the data we used to calculate the add-on was based on the previous data, which is a refraction with a known vertex distance. And we ordered the lens that would be appropriate as an add-on lens. <coughs> um, so we knew the axis, and we had good data from the cornea. So there was never going to be a problem knowing what to do with the lens. And as you can see, that's her 
Pentacam map showing her significant regular astigmatism. And we put this through the uh, online calculator with the help of Michael Kuniki, who's a bit of an expert on that. And we chose this lens. So it's based on spherical equivalent power, which was minus 275, and the sill was 375. There's the injector system, which is very easy to use and can go through 2.2, but 2.4 is recommended. Uh, so yes, there's a simmering ring cataract. I decided to leave that because the surgeon's been there twice before. And I didn't want to influence any form of uh, astigmatism. The lens came out, this was slightly larger wound, 2.75 and comes out very gently and easily. Uh, discrete use of viscoelastic is placed to create space. I don't overfill at all. And the loading has very quick loading. I, th I think the others are gonna show some of the loading. You just have to be aware there are four haptics and you have to check each one's tucked. Aim at the iris plane, not into the silcus and it's delivered mainly into the anterior chamber and then there's slow manipulation. I always manipulate forward, I don't like downward pressure and the lens goes into the, uh, to the silcus. So just some surgical pearls, four haptics awareness, you have to focus on each one. Uh, with the plunger, it's a forward movement and retract because these haptics are very fine and you want to make sure you don't engage that and trap it. Uh, inject very slowly, angle to the iris plane, expect the big lens and just work gently. Uh, what was the result? 6-6 six, six next day. A slight pressure spike, not much astigmatism. And again, uh, at six doctor weeks. Suggested that I perhaps get involved and put another lens as a replacement lens. <coughs> so the lens that I'm putting you after taking the, the other lens out has got a four point fixation. So I know where it is, and I know that it will stay there. And what was the effect of that? Um, almost instantly, my eyesight was. Perfect. Right. And has it changed? No, not at all. Good. So what, how long is it since surgery? Uh, six weeks. Six, six weeks. weeks. And the vision's stable. Yeah. Yeah, so patient was relieved because they've been through quite a few procedures. Case two. Okay. This lady I've known for 25 years, uh, she had keratoconus. I did bilateral PK. Uh, 2002 and 2004, she had uh, good tectonic grafts, but she carried astigmatism. I did arcuate keratotomy in 2005 in one eye to reduce some of that astigmatism. <coughs> and she battled along with contact lenses and glasses, but never quite happy. And she felt she was visually disabled and she wanted to know if there any options. So I said, well, maybe this is the time. We should go ahead with uh, early cataract refractive lens type surgery. So the issues, endothelial cell count, the viability of the grafts, what's gonna happen if she needs another graft, she's only 55, what do I do with the astigmatism management? And so, I decided to do a dual lens procedure, the monofocal non-toric in the bag and the full astigma, astigmatic correction in the sulcus. And I wanted to do it as a primary procedure rather than a secondary procedure because I didn't want to mess the cornea around. So that's what we did. Calculations were very consistent, right? So here we got data from IL Master. OPD, Pentacam, we've got good axis awareness, we've got good power awareness. So I felt quite comfortable that this is reasonably regular astigmatism. Here's her, uh, her P 
Pentacam maps, uh, as you can see, th these irregular astigmatism inferiorly and most probably some attenuation of the cornea there and the same on the other side. So we had to do the calculations and they were a bit tricky and again Michael helped us with this. Uh, dual lens procedure with one lens in the bag and one in the silcus. The powers are as follows, spherical equivalent uh, plus 375 add for the uh, add-on and a 12 and a half diopter monofocal in the bag. Very similar data on the other eye, which is a nine diopter and a four and a half. And this is the monofocal going in. That is the uh, biflex lens. So once that's in, all the viscoelastic is removed as if it was the end of the procedure and then re inserting viscoelastic for the second procedure so you know where your viscoelastic is and you don't have to go under the lens. And again, aiming at the iris plane, let it unfold slowly. And then dialing it in. So, interestingly, her pupil was very well dilated, as you could see, and I didn't use any myocop. I look on the slit lamp after every single add-on to make sure all the haptics are tucked, and I thought they were tucked. Obviously, she's got that scar from her PK. Saw her the next day, looked great. Saw her a week later for the next eye, she had a peak in the previous eye. So I had to go and reposition the one haptic that was poking out. So pupil control is very, very important in these cases. You know, we like it really big to start and really small to finish, but we don't often get that. So she had both eyes uh, addressed on the same day. Um, results were six, 18 unaided uh, on one day. And when we came around to the other eye, it was 612, 615, good pressures, clear corneas, did not even get any folds. And I think partly because she's got a big eye being myopic and it could stay well away from the endothelium. And two weeks later, 612. And five weeks later, she's got some residual sill and some myopia. And she's using that myopia very well, so she's got like a mini monovision. She's unaided near vision at 40 centimeters of N6. So she's, she, well, let's see if she's and into she, it. What's yeah. happened? Tell everyone what oh, you've done. Was, well, actually, I was driving here, and I was saying it's a life changer. Absolute life changer. And um, very grateful. <laughs> what did we do? We put lenses in, we did cataract surgery, and it has to be it, it's, so, um, it's your vision is 615 on the right, but able to read because you're yeah. minus 1.5, and you can just take out your primary. Oh, yeah. right? And your left eye 69 unaided, and you can drive. Correct? Perfect. So it sort of I'm changed working, your life. I'm working, and yeah, even, yeah, not even the magnifying glasses anymore at work. I just. So it no, works, you can function without glasses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just love it. It's like, oh, it's phenomenal. It really, yeah, it is a life changer. And the more I think about this last one. Yeah. So it's a system of uh, lenses where we can really manipulate how pe people use their vision. I'll just quickly go through this, which we've done before through OSCRIS, the dual lens procedure for reversibility for multifocal eye wells. So you put the monofocal in the bag and you put the uh, multifocal platform in the silcus. And I, I did a retrospective analysis of this. Um, I'm just gonna go really quickly through some of these. So I either used a monofocal or a monofocal toric. And I compared those two arms to the um, the Liberty multifocal in the bag. 
So obviously the requirements for these add-on lenses of uh, good ocular structure, I won't go through that, and exclusion criteria, of course. And these were the three arms we looked at, the Liberty, the, the trifocal toric, Liberty, and then whatever we did with the add-on. And I can truly stand up and say that the add-on, which has six rings instead of seven compared to the Liberty, centers exactly like it would as if it was in the bag. So if people are concerned about decentration of the rings, it doesn't happen. And the data itself was uh, compared, and if anything, the dual lens somehow came out a little bit better. It was 15 eyes in the dual and 28 eyes in the trifocal toric and uh, trifocal, but the data was very consistent. And this is the last case. I'd like to address that my third case, which was an SML, was a disaster, and I'd like to be the only Australian to have this disaster. So she was a 90-year-old lady with a macular scar, and we were gonna put in a SML. She had a small pupil, and at that time we were told to target the silcus rather than the anterior chamber. I aimed it into the silica through the small pupil, injected. The lens itself started to deflect down. That was enough pressure to uh, separate zonules. So the vitreoretinal guys came in. We took out the primary lens and I put on an iris clip lens. And that's a failure. But I don't believe this should happen. And the main reason is you need horizontal planar working with these lenses. Any of you who use ICLs, it's the same story. You don't aim for the silcus, you aim more for the iris, and then you manipulate after. So there's no downward pressure and force on the zonules. So the SML, you can go to the booth and discuss how it works. And this is a lady who had uh, end-stage adult vitelliform disorder. So I knew she's gonna have stable scars, and she had some residual foveal function in one eye of about 612 or 618, and that I this got... Dr. Harrisburg, talking to Elizabeth. How are you today? Very well, thank you. Now, what happened to you? What did I do to you? You put in the lens, the Which magnifying one? lens, yep. in um, the left eye, and I don't need my glasses now when I go to um, the supermarket that I can read everything on um, the, the back of the labels, no matter how small. Um, and I can read a book now without my glasses, and it was absolutely fantastic. So, they're rare. These cases are rare. I've only done maybe five. But when they do come along, this is a very useful adjunct. It's basically freeing up their hands, so they don't have to hold the book and a magnifier and a light. And it works very close up, so they have to come close to that monocular eye and read at that level. Uh, there's that, uh, the bulge, which is a 10 diopter magnifying uh, component described as the raindrop. It's 1.5 millimeters. Centration's incredibly important. And this shows how the lens sits which we'll must probably go through together. So I'm done. I'm happy to answer some questions now and then introduce Alison. How are we doing time-wise? Yeah. Good. Chair. Brian, can you give us um, any information about what other measurements you do for the add-on lens? You, you mentioned that it's a very big lens, which it is. So do you have any you know, limitations in terms of the space in the AC, white to white? You know, if you're putting in a fake guy well, you're using all those measurements to actually calculate the yeah. size of a lens you're going to put in because of the vaulting. Yeah. So uh, we have only one assess. size. Yeah. There's only one size. But those haptics are so fragile, so they do uh, fit the shape. 
Obviously, we do all the same measurements that uh, you do with ICLs. The key is AC depth. We don't want to go in very shallow. So a big, big eye and a small eye, you've got to think very carefully about what you're doing. And you have to make sure that the structure is normal. Like you're not going to use it if there's epirectinal membranes, you're not going to use it if they're corneal scars, just like what we normally do. And I think pre-op pupil sizing is very, very, very important for this lens. I think we should dilate them. I think if you can't dilate the pupil uh, more than seven millimeters, you should think carefully about not doing the procedure. So I got stuck when the pupil was way too small, but it won't happen again, I promise. Well, oh. Hi. Um, with your graft patient, I was just really curious. So, you know, like um, with my graft patients and I'm doing the calcs, I'll often do a subjective refraction just to see how much they will accept. Um, and then I just noticed that your IOL master seal, I think, was a bit higher than the rest of your seals. Like, I mean, it was, you know, by maybe like half or three quarters or something. Yeah. Do you trust your IOL master yeah. more? Yeah. Uh, or do you sort of intentionally, because everything else is subject to refraction, your penicam is a bit lower, do you then sort of undercorrect to, you well, know, no, what do you trust the we, most? We, yeah, the aisle master, yep. because we know what we're measuring and we got that into our formula, while okay. pentacam is measuring different spots, so yeah. you may get differences. Yeah. But we trusted the aisle master and did the full correction. Yeah, even if the subject to refraction yeah. they accept a bit less. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. Um, oh, Michael. Yeah. Obviously, the, uh, the, the, for the dual purpose, for, for when you're putting in two lenses, you've got to uh, calculate the sphere power and the cylinder power yeah. between the two lenses. Yeah. So, you, is, is it possible to pick your own primary lens and make the calculations, or you, do you have to have the generic one, the, the, the same ones, same brand? Because uh, obviously there's a, there will be different sphere calculations depending on the uh, yeah. design of the, the primary lens, the, the first lens you put in. Yeah, so I, I used uh, the Medicanta supported lenses, so they, but they make both lenses, and we used their online calculator, and we got some of their engineers to look at it because it was complex, but uh, it can be any lens, it can be a, any primary lens. Also, can I ask, uh, with these lenses, I've been using the, what they call the mountain folding, in other words, pulling it up rather than pushing it down to the uh, introducer. Uh, do you have an opinion about that? I'm, I'm, I take your point about not trying to put it into the sulcus straight away, but I have been doing that, Yeah. but I've had it caught. Last case I did, closed the, the injector, and I had caught the optic in the injector because it was upward, not downward. Oh, you don't push it down? No, I push it up so that it's a, you know, the, 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 the two ways of folding it, a yeah. mountain fold and a, yeah. and a valley yeah. fold. You did a valley fold there. Yeah. So I do a mountain fold. So do the, it comes do out the valley fold. fold. Indeed, a simple solution, which I'm now going to change to. My idea was that the optics, would, the haptics would go into the sulcus straight away. Do you lubricate the injector or the, um, before oh. you fold it? Because I found that if you <coughs> don't lubricate them, you have a lot more control over the lens, and if you put lubricant in, yeah. viscoelastic, and then you try and fold, the lens tries to escape. It's a bit yeah. like an orange pit between your fingers. So if you keep it dry, and you do the same as you, but push down on the centre, it sort of holds it, and then the, the haptics stay in the right place. They don't tend to creep up, and then what you're saying happens, you snag it when you close yeah, it. Yeah. So, and then you inject, you rip it. So. It's not difficult, but it's... It's also easy to trap it, so you have to be fully aware. And I, I load it under the microscope. The other thing is when you inject it forward, you can look at it. Um, yeah. You can look at it under the microscope to just see that you haven't got one of the yeah. haptics. So yeah, side. forward retract? Just, forward yeah, retract. just push and let it come back a little. <coughs> yeah. And you can see whether you've got one of the <coughs> haptics or being overridden by the shooter. Excellent. Um, so the other thing about insertion I've found is if you don't use a wound assist technique, 
yeah. get the injector right inside the eye and then what you're saying is happens if you try and do a wound assist you lose control over the direction yeah. of the yeah. lens whereas if you put it right inside the eye which means your wound might have to be a little bit bigger to accommodate the shooter um, then you've got more control over how you can implant it excellent can we also ask <coughs> add-on to do a better video the video you can't actually see where the little notches in the uh, in the edge of the optic are so you don't know whether it's right or left that they should be. I don't know if you... Uh, have you seen their, their... Yeah, you need a routine for that. Yeah. It's the same every time, don't oh, you? Oh, indeed. Know. Once, yeah. once you've done it a couple of times, yeah. you remember. But yeah. the video, you just can't see where the notch is. Yeah, and that's very in. important. Otherwise, yeah. you're yeah. loading it yeah. inverted. No, it's, so it's all under the microscope. Yeah. You've got to really, really identify that. So you've got to... Well, I do a routine. <coughs> I have the shooter in this hand. I grab the lens in this hand, and I know that the notch is on this side, and therefore yeah. it goes into the shooter the right way. But everyone's got their own yeah. way of doing that. But you just yeah. have to be consistent with it. So yeah. Now use high mag. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're going to introduce Alison, who's coming up next. Uh, Alison Chu, I've known since 2005. She was a trainee with me at Prince Alfred. She finished her training in 2010, did a fellowship in refractive surgery. She's an innovative doctor interested in all new technologies and has embraced uh, ICLs, She's embraced uh, laser vision correction and add-on lenses. So, uh, Alison, come and present your two cases. Thanks, Brian, and thank you to uh, Surgery Vision for having me here this morning. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. Um, so, without a doubt, cataract surgery is a refractive operation. That's why we're all here. So we need to consider the patient visual needs and lifestyle and their specific visual tasks, and some of us use a lifestyle questionnaire for that, and explore their acceptance to wear glasses and for what tasks, if any. Um, we need to consider their stereopsis if we're considering monovision, their ability to tolerate halo and glare if considering multifocals, and their personality type, which is not to be underestimated, and then concomitant ocular issues such as dry eye or macular disease. So it's early, I thought this might get your attention. And we'll just move on. What's in the refractive surgery toolbox? Well, we have laser refractive procedures like LASIK, PRK and SMILE, fake IOLs like ICLs, we have cataract extraction and IOL implantation or RLE, and we can use monofocal IOLs in, um, you know, uh, uh, emotropic configuration or monovision or blended vision or any configuration of that. EDOFs, multifocals, plus or minus toric corrections. And then, you know, our refractive targets can be um, varied. And so this talk is mainly focusing on the secondary sulcus IOLs. It's not a one-size-fits-all, we know that. Um, when we look at multifocal suitability, you know, dry eye has a huge impact on um, the experience of patient's vision and the results. Um, there needs to be a, an absence of macular disease. And then some of us will use our preferred method to uh, uh, have a look at what essentially is approximating the way the visual axis aligns with the pupil. We're aligning our IOLs with the pupil. So that can be cord mu, Chang wearing cord angle kappa, and I appreciate they're uh, not all the same, but um, we're all looking at essentially the same thing. And then, as I said, personality. So there are those that um, simply can't decide if they want a multifocal lens or they don't know how the halo and glare um, will turn out. And if you've ever shown patients this picture, then some people get it and they will self-select out, but some patients just don't get it. So I'm going to now go through some case studies. The first one is a 23-year-old female who wants vision correction. And her uncorrected visions are 615, 6 on 120. And she's a high hyperope, and she has left refractive amblyopia. Clearly, we're not going to laser an eye like this. And I personally prefer not to laser any hyperopes. Um, this is her corneal topography. And what I would just want to highlight here is her anterior chamber depth is insufficient for an ICL, which often these hyperopes are. So she can't have laser. Um, and she can't have an ICL. If we have a look at her eye trace, then uh, it's a little bit faded out. You can see it on your screen better than mine, but the angle alphas are quite high and they're flagging red. 
And if we look at the IOL master, her Chang wearing cord is also a bit undesirable on the high side. So the only option for her is a refractive lens exchange if she does decide that she's highly motivated for surgical correction. But there are concerns about the success of a multifocal lens in her. Um, I tend to do bilateral um, surgery with multifocal IOLs for better binocular summation, and this came up in one of the sessions yesterday. Uh, so even though she has uh, refractive amblyopia in uh, her left eye, uh, there's a big improvement in her vision with um, correction. And she has enough anterior chamber depth to support um, a reversible option. So what I've done here is a monofocal toric IOL in the back, correcting her for emetropia and a plano multifocal add-on lens in the ciliary sulcus. So this gives reversibility to the multifocal portion whilst curing her refractive error and induced presbyopia. So I've put four lenses in her eye in the one day, and actually this is something that I started doing 10 years ago when I had a patient who was a high hyperope, young, you know, in their 20s, but had bilateral amblyopia of vision 612, and so I did the same thing. And it worked incredibly well, and um, I was just was not sure with his amblyopia how well he would tolerate the multifocal and perceived reduction in um, in the in the quality of the vision. So these are the specs of the um, add-on. Uh, the Brian's already highlighted some some um, some features, but really the diffractive steps. There's only six of them, uh, and so this reduces uh, less dis this produces much less dysphotopsias, um, and it's a, quite a similar optics to the uh, Liberty Medicontour multifocal. The anterior chamber depth requirements can be either measured in externally or internally and differ, obviously, for phacic and pseudophagic patients. So I just keep these to hand in my clinic because I can never remember them off the top of my head. I probably haven't... Um, you know, we, these are unique cases. It's not something that we're doing all the time. And Brian has um, already shown some surgical videos, uh, but this is the uh, toric IOL going into the bag, uh, just rotating that to axis. Was it power? Her power. What was that? I can't remember. <laughs> been like 30, it's just a while ago. Thirty dollars. <laughs> Might have been. <laughs> yeah, plus, plus eight hyperobe. So this was actually one of my first cases, so I was probably a little bit liberal with the um, viscoelastic in the sulcus, and I had actually edited it out, but I did uh, vacuum out the viscoelastic from underneath the lens beforehand. And, you know, you really need to load these lenses yourself, which I'm used to doing with ICL, so... Um, do you guys all load your lenses yourself? Yeah, I think it's important. So that's the valley technique. I haven't used the mountain technique, Michael. And because there's a toric IOL in the bag, when you implant an uh, add-on or sulcus lens on top of that, you do want to be careful with the rotational forces in getting that add-on here. So. Um, you don't want to rotate the, the lens underneath, otherwise it becomes incredibly difficult. And in eyes where I'm vacuuming out the IA and I see the primary lens rotating, which I don't with this double haptic C loop lens that's in the bag, um, but if I do, then I'll put a capsule attention ring in to stabilise because the last thing I want to do, do is go in and have to rotate a lens underneath an add-on. Oh, there are worse things to do, but it just um, avoids a, a second procedure. So I put myocol in, um, Brian, uh, to ensure... Well, it's a multifocal lens, so I do do that for my multifocal patients, but it ensures the haptics are well positioned. So I just wanted to show this video because the loading is so crucial, and as we discussed, the you know identifying those notches, which is just near the tip of these forceps, is really crucial with, um, and I do it under the microscope because I can't see otherwise. Um, and just identifying those notches so you ensure it's top right and bottom left and you're not um, getting your orientation wrong is crucial and just tucking those haptics underneath the flanges. 
and I use viscoelastic in my in my channels because I'm used to loading Zeiss lenses, which are a similar platform from many years ago. So preoperatively, she was 6.6 six minus and 624, and we had a really good result postoperatively on day one. She was 6.6 uh, six minus and 6 on 19, and reading pretty well and seeing pretty well in her amblyopic eye and seeing very well in her good eye. Um, she's a YouTuber. She does hair and makeup on YouTube, so that was the photo that she. <laughs> 20-something-year-olds. So the next case is a 72-year-old uh, male who had best corrected vision of 6 on 21, uh, which he'd noticed a deterioration in his vision and he came along with cataracts. And he had, had an otherwise healthy exam and a hyperopic script with a reasonable amount of astigmatism and particularly high in the left eye, um, picking up on the autorefraction. And this is his corneal topography, but so this is, um, you know, no, by no means normal corneal topography. Um, and this is his Iowa master. So the referring optometrist uh, he'd seen since 2013, and the refractive seal in the right eye had been stable for many years, and um, it was just not matching up. So on the IOL master, it was almost eight diopters. On the corneal topography, the pentacam, it was almost six diopters. And on the subjective refraction, which had been stable with good, best corrected vision for many years until he developed cataract, was 3.5. So I didn't know what sill to correct and I didn't really want to take the chance of just sticking something in the bag. Um, so I did a primary cataract surgery on him and um, put a monofocal non-toric lens in the bag. And I aimed for Plano, but I didn't quite reach that. Um, and I think in retrospect, I should have been more careful with, my, with which I should have probably averaged his keratometry rather than going off the keratometry from the Iowa master. But I was lucky because I knew I was doing a secondary sulcus add-on lens implantation, so I had a chance to fix that at the same time. So I don't normally subjectively refract my patients at two weeks, but I did because I was interested to know what his target still uh, his uh, astigmatic target was going to be and he was pretty stable between two and six weeks and I will routinely get two subjective refractions no less than two weeks apart after about the one month mark um, and so Michael and the Medicontour team um, helped with the uh, the first Q add-on team I should say helped with the calculations and we got the lens power that we needed, stuck it in, and he's been seeing very, very well since, um, since day one. So the third case is a 61-year-old female. She was referred by her, her optometrist with deterioration of her vision in her left eye, and she was booked for cataract surgery by a colleague, and she was maybe told it was urgent, and she felt uncomfortable about this. So she was referred to me sort of pre-COVID, um, and her optometrist reports that previously, um, sorry, she was referred to me around the COVID period, but her optometrist had reported to me that historically she had a script of about minus eight, minus 12, and was seeing pretty well with both eyes and was wearing a contact lens monovision configuration and very happy with this. But now um, she was seeing uh, six on 19 in her left eye and the refraction had shifted to minus 20 and she was wearing a balanced script because she couldn't tolerate um, the anisometropia. And she had mild nu nuclear sclerosis, um, but it was certainly not enough to explain um, a myopic shift and that deterioration in the vision. And uh, I was using an orb scan at this stage and the corneal topography is not really that exciting, but her macular OCT shows a staphyloma in the left eye. So her axial length was 30 millimetres in the left eye. I can't read that from here. I think it says about 26 or 27 millimetres in the right eye. And um, I monitored this because with the development of a recent staphyloma, I wanted to ensure that this was not progressing before we um, headed down the path of surgical correction. So this was stable over a period of 12 months. And we then discussed left cataract surgery, but what refractive target were we going to aim for? She was no longer suitable for monovision. I was concerned about the stretching of the macular fibres with the staphyloma and reduction in um, visual potential. If we aimed for minus two in the left eye, she was going to be very anisometropic. 
Um, she did not, she was adamant she did not want her right good eye touched because she was still seeing well with a minus eight correction. And against every refractive fibre of my being, we decided we were going to aim for minus eight in the left eye. And she was seeing very well, better than, you know, one line better than predicted. She was seeing 612 post-operatively and she felt balanced and was very happy. And she hasn't had an add-on, but knowing that I had access to this in my toolkit, um, the plan is that when her right cataract becomes visually significant, I'll aim for minus two because she likes her myopia and adjust the left eye to aim for minus two with an add-on, shifting her from minus eight at, her, at that time with a sulcus add-on IOL. So, you know, we'll, we'll wait until that day we need to do anything. So the applications of add-on lenses, where, where can we use them? Where can we think about using them? They're suitable for patients as a single procedure, so if they're mainly not sure about multifocality, allowing a reversible option. I mean, everybody in this room's probably done some IOL exchanges and, you know, the, the concept of explanting a multifocal IOL from the sulcus is um, much less uh, stress-inducing than explanting a multifocal IOL from the bag, particularly when you allow time for neuroadaptation, so by that time the bag's usually fibrosed or as a secondary delayed procedure. So if the target was emetropia but we didn't hit target and for some reason we don't want to do laser or if it's a higher um, error, um, patients still come through from the pre-toric IOL era cataract surgery and I have some colleagues um, that won't put in toric IOLs. They're not at Oscars. Um, <laughs> patients that don't like monovision that may have been given it without careful consideration or patients that weren't considered for monovision or couldn't be because they didn't have good best corrected vision and they want it or patients that want multifocality that didn't um, get offered it or patients with weird corneas or patients that has, have a refractive surprise. So I'm just going to end my talk by saying not many people in this room know this about me but I have a twin sister and uh, I also have two other sisters that are twins. So, of course, in my mind, two is always better than one. <laughs> yeah, any, any questions? Okay, Damien. Yeah, great talk, sir. Just wanting for the year of very young patients who do the um, piggybacks, are you concerned about um, onset of interlenticular capsular fibrosis, the red rock syndrome? Well, to date, I haven't, but Andrew might want to talk. <laughs> um, the, the thing that you're talking about I think occurs when two lenses are in the capsular bag. You don't see that with these lenses. Oh, right. One in the sulcus and, and one in the capsular bag. So, so oh, okay. Well, the the um, use of these lenses is is great. There's a, a great um, variety of applications for them. I've used them as um, top-ups just with refractive error post-operatively. Patients who've had a multifocal lens in one eye, a monofocal in the other eye and want multifocality. And we've seen how the, um, if both eyes have it, the reading ability is a lot better. So I've used the multifocal top-up on the other eye. Uh, I've used them like you have in patients who've had corneal transplantation. And the only rider I would say is that patients who have had a previous hydrophilic intraocular lens and get one of these lenses on top, you will see calcification of the underlying lens in time. So I think you have to be very careful about that. And um, Liliana's here if she'd like to comment. We've sent our um, primary lenses off to her for examination about the calcification. The reason for that's not understood, but it, it does occur. It doesn't occur with hydrophilic ones. Sorry, with hydrophobic ones that are primary. So, Liliana?
Yeah, so thank you, first of all, for your comment on the interlenticular pacification. Uh, we analyzed many cases in our lab, but the majority or all of them were two hydrophobic acrylic lenses in the bag, lenses that have a, a material that has like adhesive properties. So when you have one in the bag, one in the sulcos, to the best of my knowledge, that's pretty much avoided. And to your comment, yeah, we did have some cases and Dr. Appel sent to us some calcified lenses that he had to explain, and we have been observing in eyes with hydrophilic acrylic lenses in the bag when you need secondary procedures, and it can be in the anterior segment, like the MEC or the SEC, or even in the posterior segment, um, retina surgery, uh, procedures needing like silicone oil or such, then you may have a form of localized calcification, mostly within the pupillary area that's very dense. And many times, I mean, if, when you have that, you have to explain because it's clinically significant. So we did see some cases where there was a top-up lens and then the in-the-bag IOL did calcify. They are rare, but they may occur. So, uh, which means that you do have to sometimes do a bit of forensics to find out what the lens style was that um, if the patients come from outside your practice. So, um, I'd like to also talk about the um, plus 10 add-on lenses. Yeah. And like you, they've, they've been marvellous. The yeah. patients have just been so ecstatically happy about it. Trouble is the indications for them are pretty tight and, um, and it, and, and it uh, may change over time, yeah. But um, um, they're, they're just seeking something and it gives them that um, extra reading ability which they haven't had before. And because you know, they're macular shot basically, they've still got the extra ability of the lens around it, haven't they? Yeah. So. So, yeah, so with the SML, it's literally do no harm because that uh, raindrop plus 10 is so small that they can say, oh, my distance vision has not changed one bit. So if you've got the right case, it's certainly a good indication. So Cameron, Cameron's been in practice in uh, Brisbane since 2016. He's done a corneal fellowship. He's got some cases to share with us. Thanks, Brian. Um, so no financial disclosures from me. Um, just just a few cases. This is a uh, another case of a patient um, with residual refractive error following penetrating keratoplasty. A, a tricky customer, a 52-year-old who had the misfortune of suffering unilateral chemical burn. Um, interestingly, had significant um, troubles with fourness C's and, uh, and also um, cicatricial entropion. Limbal stem cell deficiency was absent. Uh, the, the cornea was, uh, had full thickness scarring. <coughs> um, so had the, um, the penetrating keratoplasty, we couldn't do a DALC, unfortunately. And as expected, um, we got a post-graft cataract. So in this patient, I guess the considerations are: do, do we put a um, do we put a toric lens in the in the bag, um, or do we put a non-toric lens in the bag and, and plan for a future piggyback? Ah, oh, well, in a patient who has a high-risk graft, who's young, I thought the chance of this patient needing a repeat graft in their lifetime was was high. So we elected to um, put a non-toric lens in the in the bag. So after surgery, unaided vision was 624, corrected up nicely. Um, corneal tomography was nice and regular. Um, so we proceeded with the, um, with the piggyback. Um, routine surgery, day one down to 612 unaided, um, and one week already up to, to 66. Um, had a very nice um, outcome there. No CMO, no complications, very, very happy patient. This is the... Um, <clears throat> this is a slightly different, this is another patient, just to show um, the insertion of, of the lens here. This patient actually had a femtus um, lens and there was, referred from another surgeon, there was a little tear of the anterior capsule there where the lens was, um, was locked onto the, to the anterior capsule, um, but had residual um, refractive error. S same here, fortunate that there was a nicely dilated pupil. If it's not dilated, I have done them with a Malugan ring and you've just got to be careful of all the all the hardware in the eye, but it, I think it still can be done. Um, and in this case, as a rule, I'll 
um, I'll try to see if I can open the previous wound. Sometimes you, you, you can open it, but um, it, this opened up nicely, um, so I managed to, to get through the same wound, but otherwise you can just um, make, a, make a separate wound. Um, I, I, I agree, 2.2 is just too tight. Um, 2.4, you can get it in um, and inject it in the eye here, just looking for the, for the notches there. I think about it that they're always on the anti-clockwise side of the, of the haptic. And um, same thing here. So really, this is actually double speed. I have had, had one lens that I was probably putting it in a little bit too quickly, and it, it flipped. So I just go in very slowly um, and wait to see what's happening with that um, with the haptics there, let them unfold very slowly, very safely, and then position them in the in the sulcus. And there, I agree. I put it in the AC, not the not the sulcus um, initially, um, but I was lucky here. It was a nice nice large pupil, and um, we got that in nicely there. Um, I do, yeah. I've, I've I've had the same issue with um, with the haptics maybe folding, so um, I, I do use Mycol as well. I think it's the old once bitten, twice shy story there. So um, the, the other thing is when you're, um, I use Provisc, but I think it's really important to try and get the OVD out from between the lenses as well. Um, so get it out of the AC and then go under the, go under the lens to, to get the OVD out um, from in between the two lenses. Um, so that's that one. Um, this is a, anterior on scan showing the, the position there. So you can see that there's, um, there's a nice gap between um, the, the lens in the bag and the, and the sulcus lens as well. Um, so this is a, um, <laughs> this patient was a COVID victim. We've had a few patients, I'm not sure if other people in the public system have, that um, there was a patient that should have had a, a, an endothelial graft um, but we couldn't get to their surgery quick enough. They ended up getting an infectious keratitis and we had to do a full thickness graft. Um, so following suture remo removal, there was nine diopters of regular corneal astigmatism and a cataract. So um, I thought relatively low risk graft, um, re older patient, probably reasonable to put a, a toric lens in the bag, um, but as, not infrequently happens with this, these patients. There was residual um, seal there. So um, the, in these cases, if there is refractive surprises in graft, I'm always looking at the graft host junction. Has there been any changes there? But structurally, the graft was sound. Um, so once again, regular astigmatism. Um, they corrected up nicely, so I thought they'd be a good candidate for a, for a piggyback. Um, so once again, the, um, put in the, it was a monofocal toric lens. Um, one week down the track um, to, to 66 unaided. So um, once again, a, a happy patient there. Um, this, this last case, this is a, I, I think shows the, the virtues of this lens in terms of its re reversibility. So this was a 62 year old lady who had had um, routine cataract surgery with another surgeon um, who had elected for monovision and um, had monofocal eye wells. So unaided, 66 in the right, 618 in the left. Um, you know, poor unaided near vision in the right, excellent unaided near vision in the left. So the patient reported good distance, intermediate and near vision, um, but their main issue was that they were struggling a little bit with um, vision while driving at night. So the patient was adamant that they wanted both, like, both eyes to be like the right. We counselled about the fact that they'd lose intermediate and near vision, did a contact lens trial, said, no, that's what I want, I want both eyes focused for the distance. So proceeded with a, um, a piggyback lens. Three months later, the patient comes in saying, well, distance vision's great, but I can't read. <laughs> so can you, can you do something about this? So this is just a, um, uh, a case showing that these, these lenses are very easy to explant. So um, it was a two point, I, I went through a 2.75 um, mil incision here, and um, very, very easy to, to cut here, no problems. I personally like to go all the way across and and cut the, the lens in two. I know others, you know, kind of do a Pac-Man technique, but um, I think it's, um, I prefer to, to cut it in two. And um, the, the, the forceps got a little bit stuck. I couldn't, couldn't open them there for, a, for some reason. Um, and then obviously just putting some extra OVD 
under the endothelium there. And it's always a bit tricky to, f to figure out which part am I going to try and pull out first. Um, so, what do we do here? So, yeah, so it just, just came out very, very nicely. That was 2.75. I didn't need to um, e extend the wound there at all. And the first half came out... It came out nicely there. And then the same thing. So I just um, was trying to get a, a small... You know, just, just one of the corners out first and, and then pull the rest of the lens. So... Should have sped this bit up a bit more. So, yeah, that, uh, uh, yeah, no problem there with explantation. So, patient was back exactly where she started and, and, and happy at last. <laughs> so, um, this is just a, a quick um, rundown of a paper that we, we published um, on the so this was for tor toric monofocal um, first Q lenses for patients that had astigmatic refractive error uh, following their cataract surgery. This paper with um, Andrew Pell and James McKelvey. Um, so it was a study of 22 eyes. They had a minimum of three months follow-up. Um, 18, so 82% got to 6.6 or better. Um, all eyes got to 6.7.5 or better. Uh, and in all eyes, we got to within um, half a diopter of attempted spherical equivalent. Um, and in 82% of eyes, there was less than half a diopter of sill. Um, one, I mean, two patients needed IOL um, rotation, um, but that's, it, it seems, I think that's higher than in clinical practice. My experience has been that the, um, the stability of the lenses is excellent. We did another paper on the Solcaflex lenses showing that their torix needed to be rotated in almost 60% of cases. So the um, rotational stability of these lenses is, is really excellent. Thank you. That's good. Thanks, Ken. I, I just want to mention one thing about big pupil, small pupil. When you got these high torix, you want to know the axis is exactly right whilst they're still at the hospital. So if you'd use my call, which is great, because now you know all your haptics are tucked, you can't see the axis. What's more important? Unlike other um, lenses like ICLs, I find that once you put a toric lens in the sulcus, um, it's very rotationally stable. I've never had a patient where I put it in one spot on the table and on day one it's not in the same spot. But likewise, I think with a small pupil, because I don't mind not being able to check it at the slit lamp post-operatively in recovery, likewise with a small pupil, I would still proceed with the case but manage the small pupil before I put the add-on in. And I think my Lugan rings in that instance can be a bit chunky. So there's this other device made of a titanium alloy called an expand device by Dimatrix, so that's a really nice thing to use that's smaller than a, a Lugan ring. Um, the reason I changed to these lenses in the first place was because the sulcoflex is rotated, and interestingly, you'd swing them back to the position and they'd come back a week later and yeah. they'd be back in exactly the same position, so there's some shape to the sulcus that is what they like. Um, and try as you might, they keep going, and I've done what you've done and sutured them in. And then these came along, and they're just fantastic in terms of once they're in, they don't move. They stay on that, the little compressible haptics sort of lock it in. And if you've ever tried to rotate one of these afterwards at the slit lamp, it's a bit of a job to do that, to get them to, if they're off axis. Um, so, so I agree with you, having the nice big pupil is, makes them easier to put in, get the haptics underneath. And um, you can certainly see where that is and whatever form of, you know, axis alignment that you use to get them right. Um, and I have had one patient like you where a haptic was, um, yeah. yeah, had peaked a pupil and this was a week later, interestingly. Um, and so that was easy to put back, but it's just something that you have to be aware of. So, but uh, I think if you can get them on the right axis, they don't move. Yeah. 
I'd just like to make one comment that uh, I've only ever put these through 2.2 incision, assi incision assisted. Uh, so uh, I, I would disagree that you need to make it a big incision. Like I say, I've only ever done it that other way, so I don't know about putting it inside the eye. Uh, but uh, it is certainly possible to do it incision assisted through 2.2. Yeah, I think if you're wanting to start off doing these, you probably want to try and make your incision a bit bigger. And because the lens, because it's hydrophilic, it can come out with a bit of a sort of a burst at the end, and so you really need to control the release of the lens. And you showed that nicely in your videos, the the way the injection occurs. That don't let them come out with any sort of explosive force, because I've seen them go into the capsular bag, try and get behind the original lens. Um, sort of from under the wound, and then, like you said, try and get round the the, um, the zonules. So, yeah. so just take it easy as you put them in. So I think we've got about one more minute and one more question. Anyone? Comment? Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks everyone for coming, and thanks guys for um, being a great panel. And um, sorry, we had to change venues, but um, I think we worked it out in the end, so thank you. Mm. All right, thanks, guys. <coughs>